uh, coaching volleyball, I had an opportunity to serve on the domestic violence and uh, sexual violence shelter here in Tallahassee. And so I became very aware of um, a lot of situations that were going on uh, just in the world around us. And then I uh, also had talked with Diana some during our impact courses when we go over ethics and education and uh, sexual harassment that I thought it was really important that we started uh, doing even more about this uh, in our education. So when USA Swimming had some of their situations come up earlier this year where I believe they had maybe 38 or 39 coaches banned for life uh, for sexual abuse issues with athletes, I spoke with Doug and said I think we need to really step up and, uh, and do more and get more involved. So uh, I think this presentation we're going to go through is one that I made to the regional commissioners and hopefully it'll kind of take you through a little bit of the background and, uh, and some of the issues that we've talked about. Okay, thanks. And um, we're going to do a, to a little slide. bit of a poll here, Cecile, so we know who we're speaking to tonight. So again, if you have not participated in a webinar before, I'm going to open an on-screen poll and you are to answer it on screen and hit the submit button and then that'll tell us a little bit about you. Okay, so the first one uh, that we're putting up there is about your current USAV Junior Olympic Volleyball affiliation. So check any of those that apply to you, even if they're uh, dual roles. And then we'll take a look at who you all are on screen, and you can see as well as we can. Okay, I still need about a quarter of you to put in an answer there so we can close the poll and take a look at it. So make a, a, a choice or a best choice, if you would. And we'll get this thing up and take a look. Again, if you can keep your keep your answers coming fairly quickly here, it'll keep us on time when we do these on-screen polls. Okay, still need just a handful of people to get your answer in, if you would. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and close it, and let's take a look at who we are tonight. Um, majority of them are junior girls coaches, Cecile. Um, next okay. largest group is USAV club directors or administration staff. Uh, next biggest group is uh, youth volleyball, 11 or under. Uh, boys or girls, and we have a few junior boys coaches and a few beach volleyball coaches as well. All right, and I'd like to go ahead and get a little bit more clarification, uh, and we'll ask this one now. What other affiliations do you have as well as the coaching side? So if you go ahead and check any of those that apply, So if you're an official, you're also a parent of a player, um, or you belong to YMCA, sports orgs, or park and rec, or if you don't belong to any of those groups, you can check that one as well. Okay, so waiting for a couple more people to get their answer in there. Okay, we're about the same level we were for the other one, so I'm going to go ahead and close that, and we'll put it up. So about 41% are also an official and or a parent of a junior player. 47% uh, are also in the youth sport organizations such as YMCA, Park and Rec, Starlings, etc. And about 18% uh, don't belong in any of these groups. So that gives us a, a better idea of uh, who we're speaking with here. So thank you. Okay, great. And we'll go back to the slide. Hang on one second. Okay. 
So uh, this is a, a presentation that I made to the regional commissioners uh, this summer, well actually in May I believe in Phoenix. And uh, we felt like this was the first group of people we needed to talk to before we put a commission together and, and really studied uh, this process. So here are some of the issues we wanted to talk about. Uh, certainly sexual abuse in sport is a reflection of uh, what we have going on in society. So volleyball is not any different than, than any other sport or any other social group. Uh, we wanted to try and make sure we were going to set up uh, prevention procedures as much as possible and uh, increase the education, particularly for athletes. I think we've done a great job of uh, education coaches, and we talk about it constantly in impact clinics and uh, cat clinics, but I think the, the part we've really been missing is trying to get material to the athletes, uh, any, any staff, and then of course to the parents uh, as much as possible. Uh, we also thought we needed to look at how we could establish any kind of reporting procedures, if there were any issues, uh, what happens, and what are the best practices that we can do with that. And also, uh, I think anybody that's been uh, a victim of sexual abuse or sexual harassment has uh, really needs some guidance and some counseling and professional help, so we wanted to make sure we were going to uh, provide victim advocates as much as possible. Some of the other issues we feel like are important with uh, safety of athletes, certainly hazing, uh, concussions, you hear about that certainly all the time now, uh, eating disorders, and uh, again, some of that material we need to get to, to parents and athletes. Uh, other issues they brought up, maybe uh, alcohol rules for coaches, exactly when can coaches uh, have alcohol around athletes if they're on trips out of town, you know, really what's proper we thought they should look at that and then make sure people are aware of domestic violence. So let's go on to the next slide, Doug. Uh, we tried to put together a group of people that uh, weren't just necessarily volleyball people, and these were some people that we thought we'd look at uh, from the national office. Uh, we had Margie and uh, someone else out of her office that tried to help us, Margie Mara. We had a regional commissioner. We had someone that represents USA Volleyball legally. Uh, we had somebody from the insurance company. Uh, we also had somebody who we thought was a credible administrator outside of USA Volleyball. That was Judy Sweet, who was a past president of the NCAA. Uh, we did talk with various parents. We had coaches, athletes, and club directors. So we, we got a lot of different input on uh, putting this report together. We can go to the next slide, then. Just a little background on uh, some of the research shows that a lot of the abuses or uh, incidents go unreported for a variety of reasons, and uh, there's a lot of material out there that talks about that. Either athletes are, uh, are embarrassed, or they don't think anybody's going to believe them, or they want to please the coach, and they're just uh, really intimidated and don't say anything. So there, there is abuse going on, and we just want to make sure that we get people uh, aware of it and how they can report it. Uh, research shows it's most likely to involve a coach in a sports setting. Uh, most likely females will be abused, although there are certainly cases of uh, in other sports as well, but of males being abused by their coaches, uh, either male or female. And uh, most likely would be male coaches involved with the abuse. Uh, again, it, it happens all the way around, but this seems to be the research shows that's what happens most of the time. Okay. Uh, just a definition real quickly of sexual abuse. Uh, we thought that was important to try and put that up there. Uh, contacts or interactions between a child and an adult when the child is being used uh, for sexual stimulation of the perpetrator or another person when the perpetrator or another person is in a position of power or control over the victim. And we certainly know that in coaching and that the, the role of the coach certainly is a powerful one and that's where uh, the abuse is likely to take place. We can go on to the next slide if you want. Again, some other types of activities that uh, really more graphically describe what is sexual abuse. And, and these are the things that uh, we feel like the uh, 
athletes need to be aware of, and certainly age-appropriate educational material. Uh, exchange of rewards and privileges for sexual favors, groping, indecent exposure, uh, rape, uh, anal or vaginal penetration, forced sexual activity, and so on. But I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware of what this is, and it's certainly, uh, again, it's in the news, at least here every day, and I'm sure it is uh, everywhere. Uh, sexual harassment. Whoa. Can you Sorry. Go back yeah. Uh, sexual harassment is another uh, issue that is uh, really just as bad as sexual abuse, but it's, it's really where someone uh, requests sexual favors, uh, they make sexual advances, they uh, talk about things sexually which are really inappropriate with any athlete you're coaching, and uh, we want to make sure that people understand and, and athletes understand that they don't have to put up with that. They need to know what sexual harassment is and, uh, and how to stop that. Uh, also, uh, romantic or sexual relationships between coaches and athletes are regarded as an abuse of professional ethics. And uh, I believe that's in the uh, code of ethics that everyone uh, signs to be involved with USA Volleyball. Yeah, it's in there, and we talk about it extensively in the impact program as well. Um, you know, John is out there saying right now basically the same thing. You know, at the Olympic level, there's lots of Olympic coaches who have married their athletes and still continue to coach them. Um, so those kind of situations do occur, and those are acceptable. But when you're in a power position, it, it's different. Um, when you're an adult and a and a minor, that's very different. Um, and you know, basically, what we've said in the past in Impact Manual: if you if you're of age and you want to date that player, then don't be their coach. And if you want to coach them, then don't date them. So, not crossing that line is important. And, and I think that's that's a very good point, Di. Is that people can switch uh, to a different team pretty easily if, uh, if they're certainly of the appropriate age. Uh, some of the risk of sexual harassment or abuse arises from uh, maybe a lack of organizational controls within sport clubs, uh, dominating and controlling behavior by coaches, and, and you can see that, uh, you know, the way some of the coaches behave and uh, intimidate young women and, uh, and young men, and we really feel like, uh, you know, we've got to really keep a handle on that. I think a low self-esteem from young athletes uh, make them vulnerable, and uh, especially we see that young women uh, lack confidence, and with a dominant uh, and controlling uh, coach that likes to yell and scream and, uh, and maybe be a little scary at times, I think uh, sometimes the young, young people are really scared to say anything. Uh, the last paragraph there. Uh, particular dangers arise when such athletes become emotionally reliant on or obsessed with their coaches. And uh, we see this a lot with uh, students who are trying to get scholarships and they really rely on their coaches to try and help uh, take them to the next level. And, and sometimes the coaches use that as, as leverage, uh, which is really unfair uh, to the young athlete. And Cecile, I think the last part of that statement is really important too where the coaches are not subject to some sort of independent monitoring. You know, when they're doing things behind closed doors or not allowing parents to come in and, and observe practices or interactions with the player and so forth. So right. and, I'm and sure and you'll talk more about that. Talk about that in some of our recommendations. Yeah. Uh, again, research uh, shows some of the reasons that people don't report ashamed or embarrassed. They think they'll be cut from the team. They think people won't believe them. Uh, they're loyal to the coach. Uh, this is their family. And, and another one is they just don't know who to talk to. <clears throat> one of the reasons that they don't report it is, uh, if you can, I don't know if you'll be able to read through the slide quickly, but the team really is a family, and the coach really represents the head of the family. And it's very, very difficult to go against the head of the family. And, and so it's easier just to stay quiet, although they're, they're not going to stay quiet forever. But at the time, they feel like that's the best thing to do is just be supportive and, uh, and put up with the, the 
leading us to reckless behavior. Some of the activities uh, research shows when this inappropriate behavior is most likely to occur and that we feel like club directors should be particularly aware of is uh, when baby athletes need rides home. Uh, someone drops them off at practice and, and the coach uh, or another adult that's involved with the team gives them a ride home and we really feel like uh, you know, people need to be careful with that and uh, make sure that that's set up uh, ahead of time and that and parents and everyone else knows what's going on. But we really kind of discourage that. Uh, private practice sessions is another uh, time this could happen. Again, we'll talk about this in our recommendations. Uh, traveling to overnight tournaments. Uh, hotel rooms, uh, you know, of course, everybody in volleyball travels, and uh, you've got, when you're staying in a hotel away from everybody else, uh, that certainly is a, could be a bad situation. And then misuse of power, uh, when there's lots of touching and hanging around kids, and again, some of the young girls are very clingy and like to hang all over their coaches, and, uh, you know, I think we just need to make sure that uh, it's not done in an inappropriate way, but uh, they, they, they like to just hang around adults. So we've got to make sure we uh, make sure that nothing is inappropriate about that. Uh, the uh, alcohol use again by the coach or the administrators, uh, a lot of times after the teams have finished playing, maybe coaches or administrators go out uh, and have a drink. Got to make sure that uh, they know that they are always in charge of that team and need to always be responsible. And even after competition, when they come back to the hotel at night, if there's an emergency, somebody's got to be able to respond. So really uh, take care with that. And then also we've had uh, coaches uh, talk about, you know, the athlete coming on to them. And certainly uh, that's no excuse and that's never right. And uh, if that happens, then, uh, you know, the coach needs to move to a different team or have the athletes move to another team. Uh, some of the recommendations we talked about and are written in our report that you can see on the USA Volleyball website, but really uh, make sure that there's a responsible hiring process when people come into the clubs and into the uh, programs. There needs to be uh, a good interview set up, and we're also uh, recommending certain interview questions in our written report. Uh, we need to make sure we check references. Uh, we've done, USA Volleyball has done a great job of background screening for years, but we need to make sure that we really, uh, again, check references and uh, come up with some of these interview questions that we think are appropriate that will let coaches know how serious we are about what we're doing uh, with our athletes. And then also post-season coach evaluations. Uh, I, I feel like those need to be done by parents, athletes, uh, directors that could go on to the regional commissioners, but uh, you know, athletes need to have a chance to let someone know how they think things went, and if something that was going on that wasn't appropriate, you know, some kind of an anonymous evaluation possibly should be done. Again, we feel like education is the way to really uh, stave off some of this behavior. Education uh, of the club directors, uh, coaches. Uh, again, I think we've done a good job of that with USA Volleyball. The parents, make sure we have good educational material for them, and then the participants, and make sure that it's age appropriate. There's plenty of that out there. Uh, some of the different sports and different uh, areas have done that, so it's, there's material out there. We've just got to make sure we get it in the right hands. Uh, a shared responsibility, I, I feel like this is another area that uh, USA Volleyball needs to step up, but uh, maybe we're not guilty of this kind of behavior, but we know of someone else that is, and I feel like in our report we came up with a trying to make sure that people know they have to uh, step forward and say something if something's going on. And whether it's a matter of uh, talking to that coach and, and giving them a warning and saying, hey, you know, that doesn't look right, I don't think that's uh, appropriate behavior, and then uh, making sure that they go ahead and report them if they feel like uh, it's still an issue. But I think uh, in the past, if you were uh, to ask around and, and say, you know, do you think there's any problems, I think most people would say sure. But nobody really steps up and says anything. So we've got to figure out a solution for that. And I think we've come up with some things for USA Volleyball.
we also talked about when athletes move around the country or when coaches move around the country that um, in some way we've got to be able to uh, help each other understand if someone was a problem. We've got to make sure we can pass that on to other. I talked a little bit about coaches being evaluated by athletes and parents and then uh, share this with others when they move on. We also thought that we were going to try and put something in there that uh, whenever there were athletes around that there really should be two screened adults at all times. So uh, I wouldn't be giving private volleyball lessons. I, I could be giving private lessons, but someone else would be in the facility or in the gym with us. So I think this is the main thing we want to do is protect coaches as well as our athletes. And then how we can uh, resolve some of these issues, whether or not there's going to need to be a national hotline or a regional hotline, uh, what was going to be the reporting process. Again, a victim advocate, uh, someone that could help take the victim through the steps that they need to go through to, if they want to press charges or file an injunction. Uh, of course, by doing that, that's really uh, the only way that, that there's a legal record of what's happened. So we feel like that's going to be pretty important. And then every state agency has, or every state has agencies that uh, deal with these issues, and certainly we can get them as, involved as well. Next slide, Doug. I think we've uh, talked about education uh, quite a bit. Again, signs of abuse to look for and uh, different characteristics of maybe young uh, athletes that are having problems and what some of those uh, behaviors might be like. Uh, everybody really needs to pay attention all the time. Uh, I spoke with somebody that works with Little League Baseball and we were talking about this and uh, they've got some great material on their website, what they do for their youth. And uh, the young man said to me, you know, we even need to have uh, the people that take care of the fields, you know, little uh, little Johnny that's worked at the field, uh, you know, an older guy, we've got to make sure that uh, even he's checked and that nobody's left alone with these athletes. And then, you know, maybe we need to have uh, everybody pass a test on this information before they're allowed to coach, which is, you know, some of the material I think needs to go into the impact and people need to pass a test on that before they're uh, released to coach. Okay. Uh, some other material, what we think should be done to help prevent it and uh, prepare and implement code of ethics. But, uh, and we've got, I think, USA Volleyball's got some pretty good material on that. Uh, the second point is to have an open discussion about this and get educational material in the athlete's hands so they are aware of uh, something that might be inappropriate that they just thought, you know, somebody liked them, but, you know, it's probably not uh, the right thing to do. Um, I think we've talked about probably most of that. Di, if you want to go on to the next slide. Uh, I was going to share with you some of the things USA Swimming has done uh, when we finish this up, but they, they are actually hiring someone at the national office that's going to, uh, this is their sole responsibility to see about the safeguard of their athletes. And, uh, and so that, I think that's what they've done is just put a point person in their national office to oversee all of this. Uh, we want to make sure parents are fully informed about where their children are at all times. And uh, with travel itineraries, uh, certainly phone numbers of who to reach and understanding of who their kids are going to be with all the time. Again, uh, rigorous screening procedures. And I think right now people are screened uh, every other year. And the, the legal uh, people on our team felt like it's going to be moving to annual screening. Uh, it seems like that's happening in other areas and that may be happening in the sport world as well. Uh, I think we can move on to the next one. Some of the concerns that we had uh, putting this together, and again, this was just the initial report that we made to the region, but 50 different states and there are they're different, uh, probably for all of them. So uh, what, what could we put together that would be uh, 
I guess, respected in each state. So that was one thing we needed to look at. And, you know, the regions take up uh, several different states. We also had some concerns about false reporting, and we want to make sure that uh, that's looked into and that there's a system to try and make sure that we handle that. Uh, also, any uh, retaliation for reporting and that that uh, needs to be make sure we've got a system worked out for that as well, that uh, people are going to be encouraged to report any kind of abuse and uh, certainly not uh, allowed to have any retaliation for that. Also, making sure that confidentiality is maintained for any kind of reports or uh, any charges that might be brought forward. We've got to make sure that, that uh, that's taken care of. Again, a coach is moving from region to region. Uh, I know legally that's just a real issue as far as um, if charges haven't been filed, it's very difficult to um, accuse someone. Uh, of abuse if, if the charges have not been filed. So we've got to uh, be aware of that. And then, of course, the regions and clubs were certainly interested in what kind of financial implications uh, any of these activities or uh, processes we wanted to put in place, what that was going to uh, have an effect on them financially. Uh, so we, after this, we invited some uh, people to join our commission. Uh, we looked at the different policies. Uh, we met with a variety of groups for input, and I, I thought we got some very good input. We have some research uh, that we put together uh, on the topic, and I, I feel like uh, we want to make sure that we can put this educational material uh, that we found, I think, up on the website for the USA Volleyball, and then also have uh, the regions make sure that they have something on their website that uh, parents and athletes can go to to make sure they're updated on some of this current educational material. Okay. Uh, these are a few of the references that we looked at. Uh, the Dome of Silence is a book uh, about sexual harassment in sport. Uh, and you can see Women's Sport International had a task force on sexual harassment in sport. Uh, Mom's Team is a great uh, organization that talks a lot about youth sport. Uh, Women's Sports Foundation put together a whole position paper on this, a lot of good material, and some other uh, resources that we found, the Silent Edge, Kid Power, Safe to Tell, Parents as Partners. I mean, once you start looking at this, it's, it's really, uh, there's a lot of good educational material out there. Let's see what else we have done. But can we go, can we show them a few of the things that Swimming came up with? And we'll uh, answer some questions. Uh, yes, I'll have to pull those off of the, the email, so. Um, okay, well, uh, I think, I guess actually the coaches got those. Uh, yeah, they should have received them. Everybody on here no. But Cecile, I can, if you pull them up on your screen, if you open them up on your screen, I can actually, okay. uh, make you the presenter and let you show your screen. This is going to get scary, but go ahead. <laughs> OK. All right, so I am making you the presenter. OK, so uh, we should be able to see what you have on your screen at this point. Can you see it? Um, not sure. Nothing yet. People are saying. Nothing yet. Nothing yet. Okay. Well, let me just go through and read a little bit about it. Okay. This first one is this, it's called Swimming Athlete Protection Guidelines and Policies. And it's a five-page document. And if you look at uh, the second page, it uh, has a list of policies. They talk about uh, inappropriate touching, and uh, they go into that. Uh, number two, any rub down or massage. Uh, they go into that. 
Uh, use of audio or visual recording devices, including a cell phone camera, is not allowed in changing areas, restrooms, or locker rooms. Uh, they talk about travel, and uh, no one shares a hotel room with uh, athletes. Uh, team managers and chauffeurs have to have passed uh, a screening, a background check. Uh, when one athlete, one coach travel, they have to make sure they have the parents' written permission. And so a lot of different information. Uh, then they have best practice guidelines. Uh, all practices should be open to observation by parents. And I know a lot of coaches really don't like to do that. But I, I think it's really important that uh, you know everything's done in the open. And, uh, and, and so if parents want to sit there and watch, then you know, that's fine. But at least uh, you're not closing them out. Uh, and make them suspicious that something else might be going on. They also talk about too deep leadership. Uh, one coach member and at least one other adult who's not in the water should be present at all practices. Uh, have an open and observable environment. I think that's very important. Uh, any private or one-on-one -on -one situations should be avoided. Uh, and, I, and I think any time an athlete and a coach need to talk, you know, if it's not done in a hotel room, it's done. Uh, in the lobby or some other area or in the gym where certainly other people are around and, and can observe them. But uh, we really have to be careful with private meetings. Uh, coaches should not invite athletes to their homes without permission of the athlete's parents or legal guardian. Uh, now, there are times when you know, coaches may have a group of kids over and uh, you know, some of the parents probably should be there as well. Uh, doing room checks that need to be done with uh, too deep leadership, meaning at least two adults should be doing that. Uh, athletes should not ride in a coach's vehicle without another adult present. Uh, if um, during overnight team travel, if athletes are paired with other athletes, they should be the same gender. So I think they, they really do a, a good job of going into a lot of details. Then they also have uh, a swimming, the it's called the Athlete Protection Officer with USA Swimming. And uh, this person is really going to be liaison uh, to the uh, Executive Director for USA uh, Swimming and make sure that they monitor all of this and are the uh, go-between coaches, directors, and their regions. So I, I think this is something that we talked with Doug about, possibly if he's going to have to uh, hire another person, uh, that this is just all they do with USA Volleyball, I think that would certainly be worth it. Another document that we sent to you, uh, and the USOC has certainly taken this on as well, and that document's 21 pages. It's called Working Group for Safe Training Environments, and that's a recommendation that went to the USOC. So I think uh, certainly that's a, a, a big document that uh, a lot of professionals worked on, and, and it has some great material. Uh, there's one other thing that we sent out. And uh, it's a program called Stepping Up, or Step Up, and it was developed by the Associate Athletic Director from the University of Arizona. And it's really all about stepping up and helping someone out. If you see hazing, if you see harassment, if you see bullying, that we really need to train the athletes to step in and help each other out. And also, as coaches, we've got to really be cognizant of everything that's going on and not be afraid to step in and help out. So that's a great document. The NCAA has really logged on to, uh, I think, jumped on that bandwagon as well and are pushing this uh, as a, a big part of being involved with athletes. So that's a, I think I also had John City, the facilitator guide, which is, you know, that's a, a, a big document. If not, you can look it up. Uh, just it's, it's called Step Up, and it, it takes you through how to handle all these different situations. So those are some of the things that other organizations are doing. And again, I think uh, our report is posted online. We had uh, Kim Oden, who was a member of the USA Volleyball team, uh, was part of the um, commission. We also had uh, the people that do the USA screening or background screening for USA Volleyball. We had the gentleman that's in charge of insurance with USA Volleyball. We had uh, Larry Lauer, who also does some things with uh, hockey, but he's very big up at Michigan State in coaches education. Uh, we had a faculty member from West Virginia that does a lot of work on coaches education. 
And they, they really, I thought it was important to get some people outside of volleyball to help us really look at the situation. So I um, feel like the uh, board of directors, I think, reviewed the recommendations and they're going forward. And I'm not sure exactly where it is right now, but I know a Doug Beal and the board are very um, interested in making sure that uh, anybody that wants to play volleyball, you know, is going to play volleyball in a safe situation. So, Di, I think we're ready for questions. If you've got some other material you want to add? Um, actually, you know, we had a question just come in. Um, okay. You know, isn't isn't this most of this covered in in the impact training? And yes, uh, that is true. But um, you know, I think your group did a great job of looking at what other organizations are doing in relation to what we're already doing to see if we can strengthen an already pretty good program that we have in place and have had in place for a long, long time. Would you agree? Yes. But again, I, I think we haven't done a good job of educating the athletes. Right. Most of our education has been aimed at coaches at this point. Okay. Um, And a question came in, since money is an issue, how do we get personnel screened? Any thoughts? I, you know, one of the things that they're looking at is if the regions, some of the regions pay for the screening. And I think Little League Baseball got some grants and maybe a sponsor for some of the screening that they were doing. But I also think USA Volleyball is interested in helping with some of that cost. Yeah, and remember that um, any right now anybody that is connected any, in any way, shape, or form with a junior uh, program in USA Volleyball has to be screened in order to, to be connected with that program. Um, but uh, I think one of your recommendations said um, all adults, correct? Yes. Anybody um, that's got uh, contact with the athletes. Yeah. Um, we're even screening officials now. So that that was a change that was implemented just in the last uh, year or two. Because not every region was screening officials, junior officials as well. Um, have a question. As a coach for an under 14 level, should this information come from me or a director? And I'm assuming he's... Uh, speaking about to his athletes and maybe to parents. You know, that's something that I think USA Volleyball's got to decide if it's going to be the directors or if it's going to be the regional commissioner, if it's going to be written material. Uh, we talked about also doing some type of video that uh, maybe current national team players or past athletes uh, that are recognizable to the kids could do some uh, videos, some educational videos. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I mean, with the popularity of um, any video clips, YouTube and wherever else they might appear, uh, you know, that'd be a great way to get it to a wide audience. Does and anybody else have any their, their specific is, questions or... for Cecile? Okay, you must have done a, a great job, Cecile. Okay, here comes a couple. And I'd be interested in their concerns as well. Yeah. So if anybody else has any concerns that maybe weren't addressed in this, um, you know, go ahead and type them in. Um, and or, Cecile, are, you're open to people contacting you at this email sure. address that's on screen if, if sure. they want to pursue uh, further discussion with you on this? Okay. I would enjoy that. Okay, let me go back. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to change that on you. I'm using John's computer right now, and it's a lot more touchy than mine is. <laughs> um, you mentioned discussion over guidelines regarding alcohol use by coaches. Do you want to elaborate a little bit on that, Cecile? Well, I think we had some of the people brought this question up exactly when... Uh, when our coach is still on call, and uh, they, because they felt like that is sometimes when there could be a problem, 
And uh, I think USA Volleyball really needs to address that as specifically as they can, if, uh, just to make sure that somebody is, uh, I guess, a responsible athlete and is ready to respond to any kind of emergencies, but you, you just can't leave a team at a hotel and let the, the coaches go off and do what they want to do. Uh, so. Yeah, we've, we've had a lot of discussion just over that point in the last two seasons once the junior club personnel uh, code of conduct came out and we added that into the, the, into the impact manual, impact um, discussion. Uh, that question comes up quite often. And that's very, you all know that's very, very common, uh, especially with younger coaches who view um, you know, going to a competition over a weekend, an opportunity to party with their friends, um, and <clears throat> you know, going out and having maybe one social uh, drink is way, way different than behavior of a lot of a lot of the coaches, which they go out and get hammered, and and not only are they leaving the team alone that evening, but the next day they come in still hungover, and they're not able to perform their professional. Uh, capacity uh, and provide those those duties to their athletes that they owe them as a coach even the next day. And I, I think the, the main concern there uh, for me is that who's in charge of those athletes back at the hotel. So if the chaperone is in charge so the coaches can go out, what happens if something happens still, uh, an emergency situation happens back at the hotel, who does the chaperone call? they're going to call the head coach. And if the head coach is out getting hammered, they're not going to be able to perform in a professional manner and respond to that situation appropriately. So, yeah, there's a lot of discussion about that right now when we when we teach our impact uh, clinics. And I think it's really, that's a big a key, is just professional behavior and, and drinking responsibly. Right, right, exactly. Um, uh, another couple of comments about how soon some of this information might be out there. Um, I like the idea of materials, handouts, videos, etc., for players and parents. How soon might any of that be available? Any idea? Well, you know, it's out there. It's out there everywhere. And I, I think uh, Doug and the board talked about trying to get some things together as soon as possible. Uh, but once we turned in this commission report, I, I think he's trying to come up with a, another group to for implementation. So I I think the sooner the better. But it's just a matter of trying to uh, you know get a point person to put all that together, right? And, and making it functional for people in the at the club level and the region level. Right. It has to be has to be usable and. Uh, um, I, I want to go back to one of the main points that you um, mentioned in the recommendations earlier is about, you know, somebody has to be able to step up and say um, to somebody else or to a, a somebody in the chain of command, hey, you're stepping over the line or you're getting awful close to stepping over that line um, mm -hmm. or going up the chain of command and saying, hey, I think so-and-so has stepped over the line. And, and get it actually documented. And we talk about this in impact a lot, is that, you know, I, I taught uh, public school for years. And even now, it's been, you know, 20 years or 25 years since I've taught. But every time I hear Jay Leno or David Letterman or Jimmy Kimmel or whoever um, joke about, oh, there's another teacher or another coach that's, you know, been arrested for, uh, sleeping with their students or their athletes or whatever, it, it makes me cringe to this day because we're all painted with that, with that, you know, that paintbrush still. Even though the majority of coaches are doing the right thing, the publicity that's out there is about the coaches that are doing the wrong thing. Um, and a lot of the time, those folks are allowed to continue doing the wrong thing because nobody has stepped up and put it on paper so that nothing follows that person, you know, they'll, they'll say, if you just go away and get out of our hair, we won't file charges. We won't, do, you know, file a complaint or do anything like that. And so the perpetrator goes, oh, okay, I'll just leave. And then they go to another club 
or they go to another school district, or they go to another sport, or they go to another state, and they continue to do the same thing because nobody will step up and put it on paper. And that's part of what that um, Junior Club Personnel Code of Conduct demands is that coaches be professional and step up and do something about it so that that person doesn't go on to hurt somebody else's kids. Um, so I think that's a real strong recommendation from your group, Cecile. I, I just think it's important that, uh, you know, first of all, you tell someone that you think there's, you know, you think it's a problem and they need to change their behavior. And, you know, if they don't, then I think it's, you know, you, you move forward. But, but step in and say something mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then do something. And then I have a couple of uh, questions about, you know, potential reporting process. Would it be within USAV or do you think it would be to a different body? that oversees several sports. And then the follow-up question is, um, you know, what if a parent doesn't want that information given to their athlete? Any thoughts on that? Yes, I do have some thoughts on that. I think the USOC is, is coming forward with uh, their recommendations on reporting processes. And maybe it's going to be the USOC that's going to handle this. Uh, I, I think that um, it, we talked about identifying either someone within the club or within the region, but there really need to be probably two people. So if one of them is a problem or decides not to do anything, you know, the other one would uh, move forward on it. Mm -hmm. As far as parents not wanting their uh, student athletes to understand inappropriate behavior, um, you know, I, I think that's kind of scary. Again, it's got to be age appropriate. Uh, for those students or athletes. Uh, so I don't think of anything that would be out of line that parents wouldn't understand. Giving the material to the parents as well. Right. Right. Um, other but, questions? Know, that's a good point because, you know, there are parents that sexually abuse their children, so. Well, that's true too, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, other questions as we <clears throat> Excuse me, as we, we wrap up this hour with uh, Cecile, and then I'll address some of the housekeeping questions that have come up. Anybody? Last call for questions. Again, you can, you can feel free to follow up with uh, Cecile after uh, this program by getting a hold of her at her email address that's on screen right now. Um, and or phone. Is that okay, too? Cecile? Sure. Okay. And, and, uh, let me just thank everybody for uh, tuning in tonight, and it's, I think it's a, a very important concept that we want to make sure we uh, take care of in USA Volleyball, so I appreciate people listening in. Yeah, thank you for being here also. I do want to go to the next slide and, and talk to you about um, the recorded versions. Uh, John is archiving the recorded versions of all the grassroots webinars that he has offered. Uh, so you'll have to contact John to get the details on where they are posted and how to get um, get a look at those recordings. And, of course, his email is just uh, john.kessel at usav.org. And he'll get you that information uh, for those that you're interested in. The other thing I want to make you aware of is that we're also connecting these uh, webinar opportunities with... Um, uh, CAP recertification. So after this webinar, if you decide that you would, uh, you know, like to purchase the, the module credit for this webinar or others that you've attended, <clears throat> you can contact me uh, uh, either at CAP at USAV.org, like, like is on the screen there, or you can contact um, uh, Andy or Amber in my office or myself. And uh, Andy is uh, andy.pi, P-A-I, at USAV, et cetera. And Amber is Amber Turner, amber.turner, at usav.org. And they can help you get the link to, <clears throat> excuse me, to purchase the module uh, credit for a specific webinar. And you can apply that to your CAP recertification. Uh, so that helps you get some additional module credits under your belt. Um, just a reminder that a CAP 1 to stay recertified, either go back to another class or uh, you can 
<laughs> online modules that we have available, such as um, these. You can purchase the modules here. Uh, you can take the modules at a, a scheduled CAP course. And then we also are scheduling some specific CAP module webinars. And we're, we're, I'm going to tell you a couple of dates here if you're interested in one that we've put on about uh, Nutrition 101, uh, Fueling for Volleyball Athletes. Uh, we're offering in two dates coming up, November 28th, which is a Sunday evening, and then uh, December 9th, which is, a, I believe, a Thursday evening. And you can find that information on our website under Events tab and then under CAP Courses, and it should be listed there, and you can get information on, on taking those. Um, but if you're interested in doing some of these grassroots webinars and purchasing a, a module credit for that, um, they're discounted for you, uh, special price. So go ahead and, and contact one of us at the education office, and we'll be glad to, to help you get that set up. Okay. Uh, any last, uh, last opportunity to ask a question here before we sign off and say goodbye to uh, you all and to Cecile? And uh, I want to thank you again, Cecile, not only for presenting tonight, but for your work on the on the uh, special commission that you headed up. Um, I think it's a, a, a good document that, that came out, recommendations to USAV board. So thanks for that. OK, looks like uh, we're, we've gone quiet on the question answer side. So uh, a couple of you have had uh, questions about uh, the NFHS courses and, and other CAP. Um, items. So uh, I'll let those of you who wish to sign off go ahead and go up to the top of your dashboard and click on File and then go to Exit Leave Webinar. And you're welcome to do that at any point in time. You're also welcome to stay on and listen to me talk about the CAP program a little bit more. Cecile, thanks a lot. Um, I'll see you in, uh, what, a couple weeks in, uh, <laughs> it seems like just a couple weeks, in uh, Kansas City for the American Volleyball Coaches Association Convention. I'll mention that too. We're, we're teaching a full slate of impact, impact instructor, CAP 1, CAP 2, uh, volleyball conditioning uh, clinic, and volleyball conditioning instructor classes in Kansas City in conjunction with the American Volleyball Coaches Association. It's a, it's a wonderful event if you've never been and you can get there this year to Kansas City. Um, it's December, start, the, the convention starts December 15th and goes through uh, Saturday evening, the, the 18th. And CAP goes from that point in time to, um, to, to Sunday, through Sunday. Uh, so lots more information on the website under the CAP course schedule on that one, but I highly recommend the experience. Um, let me address the question about NFHS um, course that we did. It's a totally online course that uh, I wrote for the NFHS, so it's it talks to high school and middle school coaches, but it's a real valuable uh, course for any coach. Um, lots of states are now going to uh, the NFHS for a general impact kind of level program called Fundamentals of Coaching. And then they're, they're tacking on the sports-specific component, and ours is called Fundamentals of Coaching Volleyball. Um, that carries... Um, two module credits that you can apply toward CAP certification, either recertification, um, or you can apply it toward any uh, additional approved module requirements to finish up a new CAP uh, certification uh, at CAP 1, CAP 2, or CAP 3 level. So uh, if you go to uh, nfhslearn.com, excuse me, yeah, dot com, and uh, go to, at the top, they have a drop down and go to sports specific uh, courses and then go to volleyball. On that page, they actually have a really good demo you can play. It's not interactive, but it'll show you what the, what the program is about and what we teach in there. And it's, it's a, a, a good course, really good course. So I encourage you to check it out. Okay. Um, unless there's any other questions, I'll say good night as well. And I will end the webinar for you. And again, if you want to view the recorded version, please go ahead and contact John. A uh, couple other things coming up here at the end. This is another good educational piece that we've put up on dartfish.tv uh, slash USAV. That's a, a video channel. We have some video 
up there that's available for subscription. Um, and then finally, we want to want to wish everybody good luck in their in their upcoming club seasons and uh, congratulations to those of you who participated in your high school seasons and I hope they all ended uh, the way you hoped they would. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end this for everybody. Thanks for being here and I uh, hope we uh, can talk to you at some point in time at uh, a CAP course. Okay, good night everybody. Uh, Rob, if you're still on, which which link are you looking for? Okay, this is the this is the USAV Dartfish TV channel. Um, we have various collections of skill videos that are available up there. Uh, you can purchase a, a subscription to any collection, skill collection, and then um, it's good for a year. You can view those up to a year. We're working on other content also. Um, trying to get the rest of the skills up there. So it's it's been kind of a slow process, but we should have some new content up there uh, within the next couple months. Okay, are you good there? Okay. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and end, uh, end the thing, and um, hopefully we'll talk to you down the road somewhere, Rob. Good night.